Now, there were a handful of musicians that sat down on the bank of a river. Their gaze was set not on the beauty in front of them, but instead on the ground below their feet. Among them were singers, players of stringed instruments, percussionists, perhaps, and they had been tasked with something difficult given their present circumstance. They had been taunted by people who looked down upon them, even though it was obvious that they could not possibly muster the energy to break out into joyful chorus at that moment, they had been asked to do just that. The words they were finally inspired to write down were not words of celebration, but words of misery. The tune that they had set these words to as they took up their instruments to play was probably a slow-paced dirge meant to express sadness. With anguished voices, they began to sing. By the waters of Babylon, there we wept and there sat down. Now, these are familiar words to us, words that if we've been part of God's church for any time at all, we've sung many times. Now, neither the words nor the tune are necessarily happy ones, but are words of praise to God nonetheless. The words from this hymn can be found in Psalm 137. Let's turn to Psalm 137. And we'll begin reading there. Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept, when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, for there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we, verse 4, sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? No author has been given for this psalm. No specific tune to accompany it is written in. We aren't even sure exactly when these words were, in fact, written down. It could have been that there were a group of temple musicians, descendants of the musicians commissioned by King David to play on the Sabbath in the temple, whose lives had been spared by their Babylonian captors. These words could have also been written down as psalmists reflected back on the captivity of their nation after some of them had returned to their homeland. Now, the psalm ends in a much different way than it begins. Rather than languishing over words that can't be sung, there is a plea from the people of God to avenge them for the atrocities that their enemies had done to them, a cry to God to release them from captivity and utterly destroy those who have gone up against His people. There is a seemingly angered tone of mirth over the thought of vengeance from God, upon those who had brought harm to them, including their captors in Babylon and their distant cousins of Edom, who wanted more than simple captivity for the city of Jerusalem. And while these enemies had overstepped their bounds and proclaimed terrible hurt upon the nation of Judah, it was, in fact, the people of God themselves whose sins had put them in captivity in the first place. Now, in between the two bookends of this psalm, in between sadness and angry mirth, there is found a recalling of past blessings, a clinging on to the promise of a remnant that would return from captivity, and an introspective stirring of the hope that lies within. Verse 5 of this same chapter. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. The city itself, sometimes called the city of peace, was to be a beacon of light on a hill. It was to be a capital city of the land, which was filled with citizens who were to be lights to the world. Rather than lights, these stiff-necked inhabitants of the land turned away from their God, 
They turned to other deities who were made of stone and wood who could not save them nor teach them how to live. And that great city, which once shone brightly under the reign of kings, was demolished and rebuilt several times over. The city of Jerusalem was inhabited by many different people at many different times. And when the time was right, God would give it back into the hands of his own people so they could rebuild once more. Now before there ever was a holy city sitting upon the hill above the Kidron Valley, the thought of which caused tears to run down the cheeks of the musicians held captive in the city of Babylon, God had called his people to go to find this place. He had made promises to them of a land filled with milk and honey, a land that they could call home. The Lord had called Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, before he was a father of many nations. He called him to leave his hometown, to take up his immediate family and his possessions, and to travel to a yet unknown place. Genesis 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord had said to, to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In and out of captivity several times, the children of Abraham were taken back to the same land which their God had promised would be their inheritance. This was made their home, their property, their promise, a land they could call their very own. Not given to them because they were a righteous people, but because of the promises that God had made to Abraham all those years before. And because they were God's own special people, his possession, his property, his children, and because he wanted to bless them. On that one day, as the writers of that psalm sat down solemnly in the shadow of their captors, they tried not to forget the beauty, which was a symbol to them of their former, or the beautiful city, which was a symbol of their former lives. The city was a symbol of the fact that they were God's special people. But they had been removed from their inheritance. If only the memory of that place could be brought back to mind as they walked through the streets of Babylon, then perhaps they could forget where they were at the moment. The memory of that city was far away. That beacon, that hope for the future. If they could remember it, they could hold on to that hope for the future. The future for themselves and for their children who would be born in captivity. If they could only remember what its walls and gates looked like, then perhaps they could remember the temple which stood behind those walls on the top of that mountain. If they could remember the temple, then perhaps they could remember their God who they had previously forgotten. If they could remember their God, then perhaps there would be hope that they would one day be able to return to that city, to the remnant of a people who once were mighty under the care of the Almighty. Do we remember Jerusalem? Does the thought of that city bring tears to your eyes? Now, if I could, I would ask for raised hands to see how many of you have actually been to Jerusalem, to, to see its walls, to walk its streets. How many of us have walked through the valley below its walls where kings were once buried, where olive groves now stand, and along the paths that our Lord Jesus Christ walked many times. Can we recall the scent of the desert air or the sound of the bustle of people selling their goods? And when we think of the stones that at one point made up the walls of the temple, do we have warm feelings of home? Or tears in our eyes when we imagine the walls of this once mighty city tumbling down under the feet of enemy nations. Even if we had the pleasure of walking the streets of Jerusalem and viewing the Temple Mount from the surrounding hills, 
We have not seen that great city in its former glory. We have not seen it with our own eyes, the walls that Solomon built. We have not seen the stone or cedar or gold which was brought from outside the the city, outside the country, to construct a magnificent house for God, to make a temporary dwelling place for His presence. And yet when we sing that hymn, when we recite the words of that psalm, that psalm of captivity, do we ask our God to help us not forget Jerusalem? Do we seek joy from the thought of returning to that city? Do we focus so much of our attention on that city that even the work that we do with our hands is only worth doing if we can see that city in our future? Are the words of our mouths continually speaking of that place as our life is sustained through the days and years that God has given us? Do we sing hymns of praise to God as we remember Zion? Or have we forgotten Jerusalem? I hope you know that when I ask if we have forgotten Jerusalem, that I'm not talking about the ancient city that sat on a hill, or even the modern city adorned with ancient elements that date back into history. I hope you know I'm referring to something greater than a city whose walls can be destroyed and raised up and knocked down again. I hope you realize I am talking about something more permanent than that. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not see the city of Jerusalem, but they hoped for something greater which they could not see with their eyes. Many of their children did see the temple which Solomon prepared for God in all of its splendor, And yet some of them also knew that this was only a temporary place which could easily be removed if it was the will of God. Let's turn now to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, the beginning of the chapter here. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it The elders obtained a good testimony. You see, their eyes were focused on a future setting here, which can only be imagined in part and only by those who have the presence of God dwelling in them, the power which gives them the beginning of faith in something greater than what they can see with their eyes. Verse 3, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Dropping down now to verse 8, verse 8 it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign city, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. A different city. So many others, although definitely not the majority of humankind, died in faith, not having received the promises, as it explains in the following verses, of this beautiful city which we hope for. But having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And they were seeking a homeland that has not yet appeared on the face of this land or any other land. The desire for a better home, the faith in a God who had promised to deliver to them a place greater even than the most glorious place that they, have, they, they could have possibly imagined, kept them focused on that city. And because they embrace that city with everything in their lives, God is not ashamed to be called their God. And we now have the opportunity to seek that city. God is not ashamed to be called our God. Let's drop down now in Hebrews 11, turning to verse 39. He, through His mighty power, His indwelling Spirit, has given us the faith we need to remember that city which we haven't yet laid eyes on. Let's read now verse 37. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having been 
having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. It is that distant place, the new Jerusalem, which our Father, our Heavenly Father, is preparing for us. And as future citizens of that city where we will dwell alongside our God, we must focus ourselves on preparing our character to match such a place. A city whose streets and walls and buildings shall never be removed. The city of our God where we belong. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 in verse 28. Hebrews 12 in verse 28 it says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. God's presence within us, His Spirit, accomplishes something that we cannot accomplish on our own. He enacts the change that this world needs. He is the only one who can enact that change through His Spirit. This is a change that must be done internally, not externally. One of the greatest miracles which our God performs on a regular basis, even, is to change the hearts of sinners into the hearts of saints. His presence within us, if we humbly put aside self and pride, will act like a refining fire, consuming the dross that contaminates our hearts and minds, leaving only pure, shapeable material in which God can see His own reflection in, a process which only He can initiate and complete. Hebrews 13 now. Hebrews 13, in verse 5, says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say in verse 6, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? If we are willing to change ourselves, then we don't need to fear anybody else as long as we're in line with God. Now there are plenty of descriptions of, of those who will not be admitted into that beautiful city. Descriptions of, of sin and its sinful attitude, sinful life that we read in places such as Revelation chapter 21. We won't turn there. Revelation 21 verse 8, it says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, they won't take part in this beautiful city because they choose not to. On the contrary, those who remain unspotted from the ways of the world after their past sins have been washed away, will be given life in that city, overcomers of strife and struggle, who have worked with God to build that character that is more like His own character, His own eternal character. Those who have grown in the love of God from their starting point to their ending point will be raised up and found to be fit for that kingdom to come, which will completely surround the city that we hope to see. Hebrews 13, continuing on here, in verse 12. While we're reading these scriptures, we have to ask ourselves, has our recollection of the promises of that place helped us endure change in our own lives? Has it helped us build godly character to become more like Jesus Christ, to become more like God the Father? Jesus Christ, who has given His life for ours and everyone else's in the world. Verse 12 of Hebrews 13, Therefore, Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people with His own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to Him, focusing on Him, looking to Him and His lead, outside the camp, it says, bearing His reproach. Verse 14, For here we have no continuing city. We don't have a place to settle that is good, that is right, that is peaceful. But we seek the one to come. At the end of the hardest of days that we might have after we have suffered, when we might feel like we are held captive by our anxieties, by our struggles, by our enemies even, by our fears and doubts, when we remember that where we are at present is not our home, are we strong enough to still sing praises 
to our God in this place where we are right now? Have we sat and wept long enough on the banks of the rivers of this temporary place where our sins, our struggles, and persecution have held us captive? Are we ready to take up our instruments of praise and continue singing songs of that city of hope which inspires us further forward, even though our feet still rest on the ground of this physical world and we haven't yet seen the gates of that city? The day of promise, the day of Jesus Christ, the day when our salvation will be complete hasn't yet arrived. Our days are ahead of us and yet we are asked, even during those hard times, to sing the songs of Zion, even now in this place and in this time. Do we have the faith to keep singing praises to God even when that city, which gives us hope, seems so far from us? Verse 15. Therefore, by Him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. That city must remain in the forefront of our minds. God has given us His Spirit, by which the lessons of the past and the hope of the future are perfectly embedded into our thinking, as long as we are not clouded by the intensity of our present striving. Let's remember that future Zion now and continually sing praises to our God even while we dwell far from that promised city of peace.